He'll now line up along the offensive line on the left side. It'll be snapped and handed off up the middle to Lingard, who bounces out to the right side around the right side of the offensive line before Jamari Sharp brings them down just shy of the line to gain at around the 47, 48 yard line. Third and very short, third and one upcoming for Akron. Two minutes gone in the second half. Seven to three is the Indiana lead. And it's third down and a couple of inches here for Akron. Lingard remains in the game in the backfield alongside Iron. Substitutions coming in from both sides. Three wide receivers split out to the far side of the field for Akron. Irons in the shotgun. Third and one from the Akron 47-yard line. He takes a snap. Will hand it off up the middle. Lingard trying to fight his way forward. Gets a push from his offensive line across the line to gain. Near midfield at the 50 is Lingard. That's enough for a first down. And the Zips move the chains. Perhaps Austin, Indiana could take a page out of that Akron book and just run the ball up the middle on those third and short and fourth and short situations. Yeah, it's pretty simple there, and you're just kind of waiting at the very end. Your linemen who are behind you after you get in front and give you that extra shove to leave no doubt that the chain gain's got to be on the move. Lingard still in the backfield alongside Irons in the shotgun. First and 10 from midfield. It's a dump off into the flat to Lingard, but he's brought down immediately behind the line of scrimmage in between the numbers and the hash marks on the far side of the field. Jacob Mangum Farrar, Stanford transfer, brings them down for a loss of one on the play. Important tackle there. He was trying to get stiff arm to the ground, but made sure that did not happen. So a tackle for loss. Sets up second down and 11 back onto the Akron side of the field. The Akron 49 to be exact. Drake Anderson into the game in the backfield for the Zips. Three wide receivers on the near side. And the shotgun set for DJ Irons and Akron. Alex Adams now a motion from the right to the left. Now back from the left over to the right. Second down and 11. Irons takes a snap. Left side hash will look deep down the sideline. He's looking on the near side for Josiah Gathings, but that one is just a little bit overthrown. It was either Philip Dunham or Noah Pierre in coverage. Looks like we might have a flag. There's two in the backfield. Looks like those might go against Akron. It was an incomplete pass on the near side of the field on second down and 11, but it looks like we might have some penalties going against Akron. The first one's a hold against Nate Williams. That's the only flag. The only penalty on the play, the ninth penalty of the game for Akron. But that one was declined, setting up a third down and 11 just inside the Akron side of the field on the Akron 49-yard line. Third down and 11, four minutes in to this second half. Seven to three is the Indiana lead. DJ Irons remains in the shotgun formation. Drake Anderson alongside him in the backfield. Four wide receivers on the field for the Zips. On third and 11 from their own 49. Irons takes the snap from the far side of the field. We'll look to the near side. He's got his man at the numbers around the 30-yard line. That one's hauled in. It's Bobby Golden. We have another flag in the backfield as Irons ended up on the ground. Golden hauled in the pass around the 30-yard line on the numbers. Philip Dunham draped him in coverage, but it was a good play by Golden. And we have a penalty against Indiana. Roughing the passer, an illegal hit to the helmet on Indiana. So tack on some more yards for the Zips on that one. Correction in from the referees. Half a distance penalty to the goal line. That sets up the Zips in good field position. It was Andre Carter who got tagged with the penalty call. It was a third and 11 from the Akron 49. The ball will now be spotted after that long completion plus the penalty. Be spotted at the Indiana 16. First and 10 for the Zips. Trying to put some points on the board. Potentially take the lead here against Indiana. It's Lingard in the backfield alongside Irons. 10 minutes and 45 seconds to go in the third quarter. Akron trails Indiana. 7-3 the Hoosier lead. Irons in the shotgun. Takes a snap. Fakes the handoff to Lingard. He'll keep it himself up the middle. He skips around a couple of defenders and leaps into the end zone for the touchdown. DJ Irons from 15 yards out puts Akron on top. 
Really smart play design. The play prior, Golden did a fantastic job going to the ball as he realized his quarterback was being hit. Of course, the penalty keeps him, makes him in the red, puts him in the red zone rather. And then a nice play design. You've been throwing the ball this entire drive. Why not keep the ball in the hands of Irons? And he high steps his way into the end zone, makes one man miss. And uh, Akron leads in the second half. How about that? 10 minutes and 33 seconds to go in this third quarter. The Extra point on its way and good from Dante Jackson. It's a 10 to seven lead for Akron here in Bloomington over the Indiana Hoosiers and that's the play where. Thank you Ava, he's in an 0-2 hole here against Ty Bothwell, the lefty swings through an overpowering fastball in the top half of the zone. He sat down quickly on three pitches for the first out of the inning but Ava's exactly right, he brings a 10 game hitting streak into this one Ian. Yeah, he leads the team in doubles, total bases, OPS, slugging, and triples. And for a freshman, that just speaks to the caliber of a young player. He was a two-time All-State player in Minnesota, a Minnesota Mr. Baseball finalist when he hit 505 his senior year. So the future's bright for him at Butler. That brings up Ryan Drum now for the Bulldogs, another freshman. He is the... Designated hitter this afternoon for Butler. He's hitting 206 on the season. He's struggled as of late. He's just one for his last 13 across his last seven appearances. He's down in the count quickly 0-2 after two consecutive foul balls against Ty Bothwell. Bothwell's really utilizing that high fastball, two strike counts or whenever he jumps ahead in the count. And it's really been working for him, blowing him right by these Butler hitters. Bothwell, the lefty, comes set on the mound, facing one of the few righties in this Butler order as Drum lays off the high fastball. Still sticking with it. It's up to 93 now. It's been sitting around that 91, 92 range, but Bothwell's starting to get settled in as that velo's starting to climb. Two strikeouts so far on the day for Bothwell, trying to make it a 30 doesn't there as Drum lays off yet another high fastball. As this outing goes on for Bothwell, he's going to start to get these hitters nervous, expecting a fastball, and then hit him with the breaking ball down low. It's all mind games. It's just up to him when he starts to do it. 2-2 two -two pitch from Bothwell, swung on. Skied down the right field line. A couple of Hoosiers in the area. It'll be the first baseman, Joey Brancheski, who comes away with the catch for out number two. It may not look like it, but that's one of the harder plays in all of baseball to make. You have to communicate with the second baseman and the right fielder. And with a lot of wind blowing out towards center today, that ball was moving around quite a bit. Really nice play by the young first baseman, Brancheski. Brancheski, a guy who isn't necessarily super familiar with the first base position. He came up out of high school as a shortstop and has really honed in on his first base skills defensively after redshirting last year for the Hoosiers. Xavier Carter's up to the plate for Butler. He watched that one for ball one. He's hitting 244 on the season, two home runs, 13 RBIs for the senior right fielder. And another lefty-lefty matchup. Bothwell's going to probably start to use the outside part of the zone and work a little bit down low to just get these hitters to roll over it or, or get under that ball and pop it up. You mentioned it, Ian. It's been predominantly fastball so far for Bothwell. Not surprising the first time through the order. 2-0 pitch, that one misses as well, and Carter is ahead in the count, three balls and no strikes. And what Indiana pitching has struggled with, as we've talked about throughout the broadcast, is two-out pitching. They've been able to get two outs clean, and then sometimes these innings just start to explode on them as Bothwell finds the zone there. But Foley has struggled with it on Saturdays. We've seen... Ethan Phillips struggled with it as well. Bothwell's been one of the more reliable guys with two outs, though. 3-1 count to Carter. The pitch on its way from Bothwell. It's grounded right back to him on the mound. He spears it with his glove. Takes a couple of steps over to first to flip it to Brancheski for the third out of the inning. A great play. Fielding his position is Bothwell to get out of the second inning. Scoreless through two are the Bulldogs. Indiana has a 1-0 lead as we head to the home half of the second on Big Ten Plus. Now it's over to Kaiser. She'll drive baseline underneath the basket, kicks it out. Top of the key three from Taylor is good. A little bit of a run here from Northwood. They've cut the lead down to 46. Four turnovers in the last two and a half minutes for this Indiana Hoosiers squad as 
Beaumont's into the middle of the lane, to the left side, block off the glass and good for Lene Beaumont. Her second field goal as a young Indiana Hoosier. She's one of the players that they're gonna really want to see develop quickly. Very solid player in high school. Hoping that translates to the Big Ten. Kaiser down to Strickland. Quickly she goes up and underneath with the left hand. A nice move there from Jayla Strickland. Her first basket of the evening. Well, knee brace or not, you see the smile from Jayla Strickland. How much that basket means to her coming back from a brutal ACL injury. That was a tough move from her. Put back there from Curry Jouse. Getting back to Jayla Strickland, we talked with Northwood head coach Autumn Hagedone earlier this week, and she said that Strickland really embodies what Northwood basketball is all about. She rebounds, she competes, she has this infectious energy as we see an and one opportunity here for Maddie Volker. She Volker. got the layup to fall and now will head to the free throw line. Volker's really taken over this game. We've seen her drive inside, play well defensively. Last season averaged 11 points a game, just under six rebounds. We've seen her make some really solid defensive plays, drawing fouls. And right there, just very strong inside. Balker's free throw is good. She's up to 11 points on the evening. She'll now check out of the game. Replaced by Reagan Lauinger. Check that, that's Ava D'Amelia that just checked in for Volker. Alexis Bargesser on the far side of the floor, hands it off to Sandvik. Sandvik into the middle of the lane. Now pull it back out for Indiana. She picks up her dribble, gets it back to Bargesser. Bargesser has a lane. She'll drive with the right hand off the glass. And in, Lexus Bargesser up to four points on the evening, the sophomore out of Grass Lake, Michigan. is very nimble on that right side, getting through defenders. A three deep from Mackenzie Todd. That one finds the bottom of the net, 34% from three-point range a year ago, and Mackenzie Todd has her first three of the evening. Well, if you're a team with a height disadvantage, you want to make sure that you sink your shots from behind the arc. And they've been very consistent in that. Bardas are no good, rebounded by D'Amelia. D'Amelia has 13 points for the Northwood Timberwolves. That's a team high. She drives the middle here. That one is going to be a defensive foul on Sandvik as that was a hard drive from D'Amelia. The Indiana crowd in disagreement there as Looked like D'Amelia may have just lost her footing, may have been assisted in losing her footing by Sandvik, but nonetheless, it'll put the senior from New Boston, Michigan on the line. She has been very solid tonight. It's 14 points, possibly 15 points in just 17 minutes of play for D'Amelia. An efficient five of nine from the floor as well. Shot 59% from the free throw line a season ago, but knocks down both of them here. She's up to 15 on the evening. The lead is down to 42 for the Hoosiers. Well, she's going to be a big player in the GMAC Conference in Division II, putting up 14 points in 17 minutes against a team like Indiana. Really strikes fear into the hearts of other teams in that division. Bargesser was fouled on that drive. She tried to go up with the left hand, but was fouled as she got to the basket. Ella Miller picks up the foul. We've seen Indiana become a little bit sloppy in this third quarter. Defensively, they're getting beaten. And to be fair to Northwood, they are hitting some very difficult shots. Bargesser misses. Her first free throw, that last foul on Ella Miller was her fourth, so she had to exit the game, head over to the Northwood bench. Grace Eisenhoff is in to replace her. Barges, her second free throw is good. She splits a pair at the line. She's up to five points on the night. Well, at one point, IU was up by 51, still up by a comfortable 43, but Northwood with a good third quarter comeback. With just three seconds to go here in the third quarter, that pass Went out of bounds, but last touched by a Hoosier. So Northwood will inbound over here on the near sideline. Todd gets it in quickly. That's Taylor at the buzzer. She misses everything. And that's how the third quarter 
of play here inside of Simon Scott Assembly Hall will end. 93 to 50 is the Indiana lead here inside of Assembly Hall. We'll be back in Bloomington in just a moment right here on Big Ten Plus.